sexual assault is a reality. And in the city of Kingston, the numbers are going up. To find out more, I'm joined by Bree Hutchinson, director of the Sexual Assault Center in Kingston. And to tell us about some special funding coming their way, I'm joined by Tina Bailey, executive director of the Community Foundation for Kingston and Area. So Tina, I'll start with you. Tell us about this special grant. Sure, and this funding has actually already been delivered to them. So we're talking about this project in, in hindsight. Um, so Sexual Assault Center, we learned you know, pretty soon when COVID hit and everybody was transitioning to work at home, we learned of their needs to have some support to be able to support their staff to work at home to continue to deliver their, their crisis and support lines from their staff working at home. And so we received a very modest proposal saying this is what we need. And then they added a little would nice to have um, and the nice to have was something that we actually thought was quite a critical must-have and that's to provide some staff training to, um, to, to, to protect the team against the vicarious trauma. So now that they're going to be delivering counseling in their home where they might have spouses or children and also themselves isolated. Um, so we thought that was pretty important so we worked to flow dollars out to them early on and I had been at the time in conversation with another funding organization in town, the Anglican Diocese of Ontario foundation so they agreed to actually co-fund this project with us so we were very pleased to, to send them those dollars so that they could support their staff to get up and running working from home and so it's great to have Bree here talking about that today oh absolutely so Bree did this make a difference in the way you deliver your services oh most definitely uh, you know back thinking back to the beginning of COVID a lot of things were uncertain and it was out of no uh, out of the blue that community foundations came forward and gave us this type of opportunity to really submit a proposal to figure out what we needed and how we could best make this transition. And as Tina said, you know, there are certain things we needed to have, the technology and the software so that we can make this transition. Security, privacy, confidentiality, those are really critical to our operations. We need to make sure that survivors that we're connecting with in counseling and providing psychotherapy to get a secure connection and a private connection. But then as we framed it, it was, we would really like to be able to invest in protecting the well-being of our staff and delivering the services. Here in the center, we have, for those who have been here, a really uh, beautiful and well-curated space. We spend a lot of time uh, making it safe and comfortable for survivors, but also making it a sustainable workplace for practitioners. In any given week, our counselors are seeing 20, 25 survivors and making, holding that space 25 hours a week of one-on-one -on -one counseling. Doing it at our workplace, you get to drive home, you get to debrief, you get to be surrounded by your peers to make it a supportive work environment. Doing this work at home, it just makes it a lot harder. Not only do you have to go through these processes and hold space for folks without your peers in your community, you also have to do this next to your family. Now, like having young children, having partners, struggling with privacy in the home, they're all big challenges. And with the support of community foundations, we were able to connect our counselors with that training and really double down on making sure we can do the great services we know we can. And to make things even more complicated, your numbers are going up. Yeah, so we, we saw really early with uh, the um, onset of COVID that there are 25% increase in crisis contacts that survivors of sexual violence in crisis reaching out to us on our 24 seven crisis lines. Community Foundations Canada supported us way back in January with a really exciting project. And it was like an absolute blessing to have that type of support. And it really allowed us to better respond to survivors in the time of need. We have seen about 90% of our survivors at any given point, we're supporting about 120 survivors of sexual violence through one-on-one -on -one counseling. And we've been able to make that transition in part because of this really generous funding uh, to distance counseling with supporting 110, 112 of those 120 survivors. So it's been a really seamless transition. Well, Bree, are there more sexual assaults or is it that more people are just coming to you with uh, one, wanting to talk to somebody? Wait, which way, what is going I'm hesitant, on? I'm hesitant to propose that there's more sexual assault. I think there's less resources available. When in a non-COVID time, you know, you have family, you have friends, you have social circles to rely on. And during COVID, a lot of those support systems have been weakened and taken away, which makes places like the Sexual Assault Center all the more important. And it's, again, just bringing it back to the really great work of the community foundations, 
we have been able to make that transition to be here and have an uninterrupted service because of their support. Well, yeah, I mean, this would not be the time for everything. You know, you spend so much time alone these days with uh, they're all shut in for so long. And I could see where the, the calls would increase just thinking about it. So, you know, I was also surprised that among the, in the province, the um, institutes of higher learning, that Queens is right up there with police reports of sexual assault. So uh, should I be surprised? I try not to, the, the statistics that came out from the universities are hard to compare university to university. There's a lot of qualified statements. But of the data that we can be gleaned from the report, Queens is in the top five of reported cases of sexual violence, self-identified cases. That tracks with what we know really well. In 2018, Statistics Canada looked at violence against young women and girls. And in Ontario, Kingston's tied for second place with the highest rates of all forms of violence against young women being 25 or under uh, in Ontario. So having seen Queens being in the top five, having this study indicating that there, we're the, the second highest, tied for second, uh, in violence against young women and girls, it tracks, unfortunately. It's, yeah, it, I, I, I find it really interesting. Now, something else I wondered about, Bree, has the Me Too movement changed things for you folks? Entirely. Nothing's been the same since. Um, since 2017, we have seen a doubling of, uh, of, of survivors coming forward. In the 2016-2017 fiscal year, we supported about 220 survivors of sexual assault. In our current fiscal year, we're supporting about 420. So we've seen almost a doubling, and that's been consistent since October 2017. I, and, and, and I want to really emphasize, that's not a bad thing. We've always known sexual assault is happening in our community, and more people are coming forward to connect with resources. Mm -hmm. And that's a positive. It's also important to realize that it's not just survivors coming forward, but it's also allies and friends and peers of survivors coming forward with reaching out to connect with public education, with donations, and with a desire to see change. You know, I'm just thinking, I, um, I think every woman of my generation could probably tell you a story of something that happened to them. And in my case, I was 14 at the time, and uh, uh, I, I, I got away. It, it, um, I guess thinking back, it, it was sexual assault, but at the time, nothing really happened. And I never told anybody. And I think had I recognized it as sexual assault, I still wouldn't have because it would have got turned back on me. And why were you uh, walking past that empty building? Why were you out after dark? Why were you, I was 14, I was probably, you know, sneaking lipstick or something at that <laughs> stage. And uh, why were you wearing lipstick? It, it, it would have got turned back on me. And um, has that changed or do, do people still turn around and say, well, you know, you shouldn't have been there or you, it was all your fault. Are, are we still hearing that? Yeah, thank, thank you for sharing that story. Unfortunately, that narrative that you heard then is still very true today. And that's why it's really important for places like our center to say undeniably, unquestionably, that a survivor is never at fault for the violence they experience. A survivor is never responsible for someone else's actions on their body. And unfortunately, we still have to make that loud and proud and really clear because we see a lot of victim blaming language constantly worded throughout our conversation about sexual violence. You know, um, part of me says, uh, I, I don't go, um, I won't walk alone at night or I won't uh, do certain things. I'll, I, I've always got my, my, you know, my antenna up. But then the other part of me says, why the heck should I? Why shouldn't I be able to? And, and I, I've always conflicted over that, whether, um, you know, just don't invite problems. I, I'm always conflicted about that. Yeah, I, everyone has to make their own risk equation. and have, They all have to figure out their own safety and their own balance. You know, I believe every woman, every individual should live a life free of sexual violence. And that's why our center is dedicated to seeing that world come true. But how we navigate those decisions on a day-to-day -day basis is up for every individual person. Um, as a trans woman, there's a lot of times when I experience, and I put myself in spaces 
that put me at higher risk of transphobic violence. Sometimes I'm ready to fuck up and I'm ready to face that music. Other times I'm not. And that's a personal decision that I get to navigate. Everyone gets to do it, but no one should live under the threat of violence. Yeah, and, and, and it doesn't matter what your, your age or your gender or anything else, I absolutely agree. Wow, uh, I have learned a lot today and I do appreciate both of you being with us. And Bree, if people want to help out, what is it you need that the rest of us can help you with? I think the first step is always starting the conversation. You know, there's the easy conversation of like donations and support, but what we really need is a community conversation that recognizes that a world free of sexual violence is possible. We need to act and behave like it, and we can make it true. Let's start a conversation. You know, talking about rape and sexual violence is not something people like doing, but we'll, it thrives in that awkwardness, and that uncomfort. So we need to get honest, confront it, and engage in the conversation. I, not to be so self uh, front about it, but I also really want to give a shout out to the Community Foundation of Kingston area. Organizations like Community Foundations support our innovative work. You know, we like trying new things. And the Community Foundations is a perfect funder for that opportunity for us to experiment and try new projects. And that's really critical for us to build a world free of sexual violence. Appreciate this. Thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you for having me.